Royal Britannic Majesty's ship, the Bounty. She sailed the seas 150 years ago. Near the island of Tahiti, her crew mutinied and set the captain adrift in an open boat. And so was born that thrilling saga of the sea, Mutiny on the Bounty, famed in history, in literature, and on the silver screen of the cinema. Now the penalty for mutiny is death. So the mutineers, some with lovely native Tahitian wives, set out to find an unknown island, hoping they might never see a strange white face again. Eventually, they found Pitcairn, a bald, lifeless rock lost in the vast ocean wastes. Let's sail today, in the wake of the bounty, our modern steamship in desperate battle with that same churning Pacific the little bounty fought so valiantly, until we rediscover the rock-bound refuge to which fled the renegade crew, selected by the mutineer leader Fletcher Christian because, if known at all, Pitcairn's actual position was almost legendary. He chose wisely. Even today, Pitcairn is far from the ocean lanes used by travelers. Stark and jagged, it has no harbor where a ship may enter. Nothing but a cruel armor of murderous reefs, which protects it now from the encroachments of civilization, as it protected Fletcher Christian and his mutineers from discovery, as it has kept intact to this day the isolation and the primitive simplicity of some 200 souls. For on Pitcairn today live only the descendants from marriage and intermarriage, of those desperate English sailors and their brown-skinned wives. Perhaps, therefore, we can find in Pitcairn a modern utopia, a land where, in truth, the only law is the law made by the people entirely for the people. This, then, would be utopia's only town, Adamstown, a flimsy group of improvised houses built of driftwood and the wreckage of ships. No real estate taxes here, no personal property taxes, and no income taxes, because no one on Pitcairn has any income at all. This remnant of the bounty's rudder proves that she was indeed built of stout English oak and good hand-wrought iron, a priceless relic only recently discovered from its grave beneath the sea for a century and a half. But strangely enough, without the slightest help from modern science, a Pitcairn baby objects to its bath, just as babies do in Boston, London, or Kankakee. The united, amalgamated, consolidated Pitcairn laundry just imagine your favorite shirt coming home from this modern machine. Building roads on Pitcairn is a very simple matter. Everybody goes to work. Everybody pays his road tax with his strong right arm. They are boat builders, too. The finest surf boats afloat are built on Pitcairn. For a century, the islanders have been studying and experimenting, often at the risk of their lives, in order to build boats that can conquer the merciless surf. Strangely enough, these boats are built 500 feet above the sea and carried down the mountain to first taste their native element. All the battles of England are not won on the cricket fields of Eton, for there are cricket bats even on Pitcairn. The primitive handsaw, each family has one, but Pitcairn's native wood is almost useless for construction purposes because of its soft and spongy fiber. Like many another primitive people, the Pitcairn Islanders long ago discovered for themselves the secret of hillside farming. These are man-made terraces, improvised in an effort to coax just a little more fertile response from the unwilling soil. Not many things grow on Pitcairn. One of the crops is sugarcane, which is lugged to a community mill. Try hitching yourself up with a horse sometime. It's supposed to be very good for your waistline. This is the only horse on the island, probably the only horse in all the world which belongs equally to 200 people. So with one horsepower and 20 foot power, the succulent cane juice is squeezed out to be allotted share and share alike among the residents. The taro plant is one of Pitcairn's most important food items. A busy industry is the preparation of the roots. Pitcairn's babies are practically reared on taro root and coconut milk. See that tow-haired youngster on the left? I wonder what tawny-headed English sailor man of the bounty bequeathed those blonde locks. And here's little Viola Christian direct descendant of the mutineer leader and a worthy example of Pitcairn's younger set. Salt, the indispensable seasoning of all food, comes from the sea itself. In gasoline cans bartered from passing ships, salt water is carried up to the boilers. With long and arduous labor, they extract the powdery product that you shake so lightly from your silver container. Even on Pitcairn, there is also hunger of the soul. Violins can be made, strings can be twisted from gut, to string her bow, this girl used her own hair. From the violin comes a plaintive lament brought from Tahiti by her ancestors. The listening child broods moodily. The tragedy in her eyes bred of that day 150 years ago when white men and brown women left their Tahitian paradise for this desolate rock. Primitive arts have not changed. Aunt Annie McCoy, direct descendant of Seaman McCoy, one of the mutineers, is weaving a basket from the leaves of the pandanus palm. 
Her gnarled old fingers do as deft a job as they did 60 years ago. These fancifully painted coconuts are not for home consumption. They're destined to travel to lands so different that the coconut painter herself will not believe you if you tell her about them. And these boys have not made these little sailboats to be their own playthings. What is the answer to all this industry? Once more, Pitcairn is going to have contact with the outer world. A steamer has been sighted, and Pitcairn is going to go shopping. The children can't go along, but just as excited as your children at Christmas time, they climb coconut trees to stare wide-eyed. Down the crude trails from Adamstown, 500 feet above the sea, comes everyone, each bringing what he or she has been able to manufacture out of nothing. Perhaps a year's work of a whole community has gone into these plaintive bundles of homemade merchandise. Out come the Pitcairn boats, for no ship would dare launch its boats in an effort to land them, even in this bay where years ago the fugitive Fletcher Christian burned and sank the bounty. It's hard work going shopping on Pitcairn, for shopping reaches its rarest form when you have to risk your neck to sell your basket. And only the Pitcairn Islanders, those who live here and know the treacherous breakers, dare chance their fury. A friendly rope is thrown, and the passengers gaze down in wonder as the boats defy the sea itself. The pitiful souvenirs of Pitcairn are brought to market for part. Sometimes a curious passenger wants to visit the island, so he, or in this instance she, must be lowered to the boat, while the children stare in astonishment. Some of the very young ones have never spoken to a stranger. Bargain day is over, sales and trades are made, and the people of Pitcairn beat their way back against the tearing, relentless sea. And when the visitor first comes close to the island with its precipitous walls and its crashing surf, he realizes how well Fletcher Christian chose his tragic hiding place. Even in the calmest weather, a heavy surf rips through the narrow passageway between rocks and a bounty bay, the only place in all the island where a landing may be negotiated. And what did the Pitcairners buy with the fruits of their labors? First and most important, some lumber. Nothing is more precious on Pitcairn than lumber. Good, workable lumber with which to bolster up the sagging homes in the ancient church. The islanders gather at the community center, where everything from the ship is pulled into one community interest and each of the 52 families receives its due share. These tin pails contain flour, and tonight there will be feasting on Pitcairn. And if Johnny is a very good boy, he'll be allowed to have a piece of real white bread for dessert. The visitor to Pitcairn may see something older and perhaps even more significant than the children of that famous mutiny which wrote Pitcairn's name on history's record. Fletcher Christian told his young Tahitian wife that the island was unknown and uncharted, and his first investigations prompted him to believe it had never been inhabited. And then one day the beautiful Polynesian girl led him high into the rugged mountains, and there showed him the record of a people who had lived there hundreds of years before, perhaps as far back as the Stone Age, an unknown people who had occupied Pitcairn and then disappeared into the thin air, leaving only these weird and primitive hieroglyphics as a record of their stay. Well, the great day is over. The visitors have gone back to the ship. Pitcairn's gallant boats are hauled up and put away until fate shall make them useful again. And Pitcairn is happy, thrilled with its few pounds of flour, its sticks of lumber, its packets of needles and thread, and settles down to await the next ship. This year, next year. And all of Pitcairn's 200 simple souls are unaware that the greatest luxuries of which they could possibly dream can be bought by you and you and you in the nearest five and 10 cents store. Utopia, I wonder.